External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar is all set to hold a bilateral meet with United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken shortly. This is coming in the backdrop of India's very public criticism of the US over the F-16 fighter jets D. Shankar has questioned the rationale behind the latest American security assistance to Pakistan. Now, India had already objected to the deal earlier, but while in Washington, D.C., the External Affairs Minister went a step further saying, you're not fooling anybody. Jay Shankar raised questions over the It has neither served Pakistan nor the United States. In the response to Jay Shankar's statement, Biden administration just said that India and Pakistan are both partners of the U.S. with different points of emphasis. Remember, this is happening because America approved a 450 fighter jet fleet program to Pakistan, revise, reversing the decision of the previous Trump administration to suspend military aid to Islamabad for providing safe havens to terror networks. Now, the external affairs minister, a former diplomat himself, is known for his record straight in his inimitable style during this US trip as well. First and foremost, he made it clear it's one thing to give an aid to Pakistan, but to defend it by saying it is for counter-terrorism, the US is not fooling anybody. He added that this relationship with Pakistan has served neither party. What happened in Afghanistan, the fact that the most dreaded terrorists get found in Pakistan is a clear proof of that. Earlier at the UNGA also, the minister was categorical in taking on terror forces. His message was clear to the world at large, defend terrorists at your own peril and that no rhetoric can cover bloodstains, a clear message to US and Pakistan too. Finally, the minister also didn't shy away from taking on Article 370 abrogation detractors globally, emphasizing that the provision was temporary to begin with, and in fact, the article was an act of majoritarianism, not the act of removing it. Like I said, not the first time, Jashankar has changed the way India is reacting and putting itself across. The question we ask today, is whether India is asserting itself the right way. A relationship that has neither ended up serving Pakistan well nor serving America. So it is really for the United States today to reflect whether this is, you know, what are the merits of this relationship, what do they get for someone to say, I'm doing this because it is for counter-terrorism. When you are talking of an aircraft that is capability of the UC, everybody knows you know where they are deployed and what is the use and what you're not fooling anybody by having borne the brunt of cross-border terrorism for decades, India firmly advocates a zero tolerance approach. In our view, there is no justification for any act of terrorism, regardless of motivation. And no rhetoric, however sanctimonious, can ever cover up bloodstains. There's a big song and dance about internet uh, uh, being cut. Okay. Now, if you've reached a stage where you say an internet cut is, is, inter is uh, more dangerous than the loss of human lives, then what can I say? Let me go across to Michael Kugelman, who's South Asia expert at the Wilson Center. Joining us, Vishnu Prakash is former diplomat and spokesperson of the MEA. Michael, let me begin with you. Isn't it only fair when, you know, dreaded terrorists keep getting caught in Pakistan, like Zawari recently, and they're actually neutralized in Pakistan by American forces? Is it not only fair that India has called out this running aid of the US to Pakistan? Well, it's certainly understandable uh, that the Indian government would, would want to call this out. Uh, I mean, this is this is the pattern that we've seen in this U.S.-India-Pakistan triangle over time mm. that uh, in previous years, not not really since 2018, when the U.S. had suspended security aid to, uh, to Pakistan. But before 2018, you know, the U.S. and Pakistan have an alliance. And so there had been many times in the past when the U.S. had supplied weaponry to Pakistan, and understandably so, it had been re it had been received um, uh, very uh, very negatively mm. by by India. But you know, I think that we shouldn't 
focus too much on the significance of this. We're not talking about sending new aircraft or new equipment to uh, to, to Pakistan. This is simply, as I understand it, uh, financial assistance to allow Pakistan to refurbish um, its existing F-16 uh, fleet. Um, but uh, I, I think that India's response is, is predictable, understandable, and in line with the response that it has given in the past when Pakistan has engaged, or pardon me, when Washington has engaged in these, uh, these military sales to Pakistan. Yes, and you know what pinches India possibly is that look at where these F-16s get used. They get used against India, for heaven's sake. At least let's not project it as some sort of a counter-terror mechanism in Pakistan. But Michael, before I go to Vishnu, I also want to ask you, you know, this is something we've been debating since the Afghanistan debacle. Look at what happened there. Despite US's continuous aid to Pakistan for these so-called counter-terror measures, why is the US so reluctant in reimagining its relationship with Pakistan, in putting greater pressure on Pakistan? Well, this is the story of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, that uh, it's always been an uneasy, unsettled relationship, but one that has endured in great part because the view of Washington, uh, and one could one could challenge this, but the view of Washington over time has been that uh, Pakistan, uh, it, it serves U.S. interests to maintain a, a relationship with Pakistan, including a, uh, a security one. I think that the, the, new, the relatively new government in Pakistan has provided a bit of an opening for the U.S. to explore uh, expanding the relationship a bit. The relationship with Pakistan, of course, had been in a bad place during the last few months of Imran Khan's government when he was accusing the U.S. government of having overthrown him. Hmm. Uh, and I think also, remember, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship is a very transactional one. It is not strategic. And you always have to be thinking about what each side what's, wants to get out of the other. And we know that the U.S. is trying to um, maintain its ability to, to manage terrorism threats in Afghanistan. And we know that the U.S. would like to be able to continue to have airspace rights hmm. in Pakistan. And so perhaps we could look at this. I don't want to speculate too much, but one can't rule out the possibility that uh, the U.S. thought that by um, providing this this new assistance to Pakistan to uh, to maintain its F-16 fleet, that that could uh, make Pakistan more likely to allow the U.S. to use its airspace uh, for counterterrorism related purposes. In yeah, but then at least let's not try and project like this is going to be counterterrorism the way these F-16s are going to be used. But Vishnu Prakash, I want to come to you. You know, this, this duplicity needs to be called out. And Mr. Jay Shankar has been doing a fantastic job in calling out this Western duplicity. I mean, the U.S. tries to pile on pressure on India over the Russia-Ukraine conflict in which we have absolutely no role to play. And just for maintaining our relationship with Russia or even buying cheap crude oil from Russia, we were being, you know, criticized by America. And what America is doing with Pakistan. It was very essential for Mr. Jay Shankar to call out this hypocrisy and duplicity over terror. Uh, absolutely, Dr. Jay Shankar is spot on, and he is known for his plain speech. Let's let's step back a little and look at it a little more closely. I tend to agree with my co-panelists that it is not something that is directed at India. It is more to do with the U.S.'s own compulsions. Hmm and need in Afghanistan and their, their desire to maintain a uh, relationship with Pakistan. We don't like it, but uh, well, the uh, U.S. will do what in U.S.'s interest is in, will do what is in U.S.'s interest. Uh, speaking from the U.S. perspective, uh, they have an old relationship with Pakistan uh, it, back to the early 50s. Uh, Pakistan has uh, from time to time served U.S. interests uh, well. It's key Islamic state. It's it is a. I'm talking from the U.S. perspective. It is mm. an important location. It is a conduit to Afghanistan and so on. So no, uh, all that is US fair, Vishnu will, Prakash, which is precisely why I mentioned this whole Russia thing. No, so, why did they expect no, that they, India was going to do something which was not in India's interest just because no, it will look good the, on America? Uh, but that, because they do what is best for them. Yes, it is standard diplomatic uh, foxtrot, nothing more, nothing less. I don't think that there is anything more to it. You know, the U.S. has tried to put its point of view. We have very politely and firmly said that, look, this is what is in our interest. Mm. When we talk of strategic autonomy, we will do, there is a light pressure on us. Mm. We will do what we need to do. Similarly, when we tell the U.S. that, look, there is terror from Pakistan, which is uh, targeting India, 
they attach more importance or the, for them the bigger concern is al qaeda and islamic state and the taliban mm. they have generally not paid any concern to pakistan based terror groups i mean that's a we have to live with that uh, but the important thing is to see the quality of relationship i don't think there is any comparison between india us and, and pakistan, india, pakistan us Fair relationship enough. Fair One enough, but I think it was essential, especially after the pressure that was One being mounted contain, on India over Russia-Ukraine conflict and the crude oh, oil, that India needed to obviously remind try, took, India needed to remind America too our, that listen, you do what is right for you. Next time, don't try to pile on pressure on us. Uh, before I let you go, I also want to touch upon what Mr. Jeshankar said on the Western media. And Michael, I'm coming to you on that. He criticized the fact that there have been biases in the Western media. You know already what they're going to say. Why those biases exist, whether it's because Narendra Modi is in power now, frankly, that's up for debate. But is it not time that Western media, American media, should stop being so sanctimonious and preachy to India? That's the message that Mr. Jeshankar was sending out. Well, I mean, the, the Western media is not the same thing as a Western government, right? The Western media is generally quite free, and it's going to report what it feels fit to report. And so uh, naturally, that's going to entail taking uh, certain positions. Uh, I certainly don't think that there's anything inherently wrong uh, with uh, Western media coverage, uh, though certainly one could argue that, um, you know, what, at, at the end of the day, media outlets are looking for big stories and stories that will make news and sell. And so, you know, mm. focusing on, on negative news and troubling news, that's always going to dominate. That's not just something that the Western media focuses, that's media on the whole, mm. uh, right? The idea is to ensure that people are watching, people are reading, people are listening. And that's going to entail focusing on on certain types of um, certain types of stories um, for sure. But uh, again, the, you know, the, the Western media is not Western governments. Uh, they do not reflect the views of, of particular governments. They reflect their own views and uh, editorial decisions rooted in this idea of what are the big stories that will be destined to get the most readers. And at the end of the day, help meet the bottom line of these of these media organizations. Fair enough. But what do you make of uh, Jay Shankar's statement that there is bias against India in Western media? And also, is there a feeling in the diplomatic circles that they are dealing with a new India, that this dispensation or this phase of Indian diplomacy is different and they're not going to take it lying down? Well, I mean, I guess it depends how you define bias, right? Uh, if, if one wants to say that uh, if if a media organization is focusing on stories that bring attention to concerning issues in any particular country, I guess one could refer to that uh, as 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 a bias. But uh, I don't think it's my place to to comment on, uh, how the Western media decide to. Uh, to 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 select their stories and make editorial decisions. Mm. Um, uh, it certainly it's true going back to the to the pandemic, but even well before that, mm. one could argue that uh, Western media coverage of India has focused on the more troubling aspects of the country. And I guess one could make an argument that it's there hasn't been more of a focus on on positive success stories. But then again, there has been plenty of focus in the Western press on issues like the tech industry in India, which is a big success story. Uh, India's enduring democracy, things like that. Um, so I, I just don't feel comfortable talking about whether it's accurate to discuss, to talk about a bias. But uh, again, Western media are and any media are going to pick the stories that they think will be most likely to get uh, the most attention, those that they think are most important, those that they think will, will be read. Okay. Um, and I think it's, that's, that's the best way to, uh, well, to of make course, that point. Media freedom aside, the, well, the reason possibly bias gets talked about is Michael used an interesting word, Vish, uh, Vishnu Shah, that... Uh, that uh, troubling aspects of India. Now, he was speaking particularly about the abrogation of art. What that happens is that a lot of Western journalists try to give some sort of a, you know, message to India about how it's not upholding certain standards or its human rights record without trying to understand either India's history or reality in India. He was to say that removing Article 370 is problematic. They don't understand the fact, which is what Shankar said. One, it was a temporary arrangement as per Indian constitution. And secondly, the fact that this article existed in Jammu and Kashmir. Minorities in Jammu and Kashmir. So they don't understand the situation, but they still are very preachy. That's what possibly he was getting at. 
No, no, we have to, we, don't you know that the Western media knows what is good for India? 35 million people, hmm. 1.35 billion people, we don't know what's good for India. So, I mean, of course, the Western media preaches and tells, tells India what to do. I mean, that is the arrogance that, uh, uh, that they have displayed and are you know, they can only see the glass half empty when it comes to India. Mm -hmm. There is certainly a bias. There is no no denying the fact. And it, uh, we, uh, when you talk of press freedom, I mean, the reality is that the Western media takes a cue from the governments of the day and uh, in unison uh, furthers what the government's agenda is. But mm -hmm. it's a Western agenda. So we have to, we are, and, uh, but we also today have the strength of, of projecting our own viewpoint and regardless, we are not looking at the Western media for endorsement, endorsement except for a approval. handful of people right. here who uh, look at the Western media, they will do what they'll further. India's caravan will move on and we will do what is right for us. I mean, we have learned this game and two can play the same game now. Right. Uh, in fact, I, Michael, I was asking you earlier, is there a sense in the diplomatic circles that the manner in which India is asserting itself is, is that being noticed? They apply Sir, that question is for Michael. India, for Michael. India which can... Well, certainly, I think that uh, Dr. Jai Shankar has done a, has done a terrific job uh, acting as a... Uh, as a chief representative of, of India overseas, so to speak, as the mm. external affairs minister. And I think that he's, 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 he's done a very good job of trying to articulate um, India's interests and India's views uh, in, a, in a way that's understood. And, in, and in, in most cases, I would argue respected, um, mm. for sure. We're seeing this very strong, emphatic, definitive, confident tone. Uh, and certainly that's, that's something to note. But, um, you know, again, that's just, that's just how one diplomat does business. And uh, everyone has their own style, so to speak. All right. I'll leave it at that. Uh, we are, of course, waiting to hear from uh, S.J. Shankar and Anthony Blinken on what exactly transpires as far as their meeting is concerned. I thank our guests for joining us. Time for a very short break. On the other side, we'll get to the day's biggest story. Plus one side.